Uh, good morning and thank you for attending uh, today's uh, NENCAS webinar. Uh, we have two talks today, one from Yvette Buono about um, IV to oral switch and then Doris Chibo from the uh, Victorian Infectious Diseases Reference Laboratory we're talking about um, some HIV resistance. To start with we'll have Yvette and she's talking from, uh, speaking from uh, Sydney so hopefully we can get her online. Hello, Yvette, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you, Rod. Excellent. Uh, welcome, Yvette, and thank you for your talk. And you can start now. Okay. All right. Thank you to the NCAS team for inviting me to present this journal club. Um, I thought I would talk about intravenous to oral antibiotic switch um, and some of the recent publications. And this is partly driven by a project that the Clinical Excellence Commission is doing with, um, with a hospital in Sydney on IV to oral switch. So I thought it was a good chance to share what we've, um, what we've learned in our literature review um, with, uh, with a broader audience. So firstly, um, IV to oral switch initiatives are included in national guidance um, in several of our peer countries. So in the USA, um, the IDSA and SHEA guidelines for AMS recommend um, that AM antimicrobial stewardship programs, implement programs to increase timely and appropriate use of oral antibiotics and also that timely transition from IV to oral switch. And in the UK, in England, the Advisory Committee on Antimicrobial Resistance and Healthcare Associated Infections have a smart, smart a Start Smart Then Focus program, and that includes an IV to oral switch component with a focus on review at 48 hours. And in Scotland, they also have IV to oral switch guidance. When we're talking about IV to oral switch, it's important to clarify what we're talking about. So there are different types of IV to oral switch. Um, firstly, there's replacing an injectable antibiotic with its oral counterpart, so something um, where you would use the same dose and it's therapeutically equivalent, say like fluconazole. Um, then there's changing from an injectable antibiotic to the oral equivalent. So if we're, say, using ampicillin, changing that to amoxicillin. Uh, and then there's step down therapy, which is really where you're changing from an injectable antibiotic to an oral antibiotic, but it might be in the same class, it might be in a different class, and the frequency, dose, and spectrum of activity may not be the same. So um, uh, the papers that I'm talking about are broadly about IV to oral conversion. Um, so most of you would know there's lots of benefits of timely conversion to oral antibiotics. So firstly, from the patient's perspective, it's more comfortable and it makes them more mobile. They're not connected to an IV um, drip. It reduces healthcare costs. Um, generally, if the IV antibiotic is the reason that's keeping the patient in hospital, timely conversion to oral antibiotics will reduce the length of stay. It saves staff time because oral antibiotics are easier and quicker to give than um, then making up IVs and administering them and also it reduces the need for an IV um, line and that reduces the risk of line associated infections and complications. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is a few papers that uh, address what prevents the IV to oral switch, how we can develop criteria for safe IV to oral switch and how we implement um, IV to oral switch initiatives just briefly. Um, so I found this paper by Bake and Zvonna um, from Canada and they uh, listed the concerns that their antimicrobial stewardship team at the Ottawa Hospital um, in Ontario um, frequently encounter when they're, when they're trying to persuade clinicians to switch their patients from IV to oral um, antibiotics. And so um, the reasons include things like um, beliefs that there's no significant benefits of making the switch, that the oral form doesn't yield as high concentrations as IV, that bioavailability data is derived from healthy volunteers and therefore doesn't apply to their particular patient, um, that the patients who are treated with the IV formulation have better outcomes than those treated with the oral form, concerns about their patient being in ICU or having a feeding tube and that affecting absorption. And I thought this one was really um, 
interesting, if the infection does not resolve, I will know it's not because of poor antimicrobial absorption. Um, the paper goes on to review the literature to um, uh, formulate a response to these concerns. So I won't go through all of that, but um, but I just thought it was interesting to outline what the what the concerns are and what some of the barriers to switch can be. Um, some of you are probably familiar with um, the work of Jennifer Broom and colleagues um, and this particular paper I find very interesting. So it was a paper um, called What Prevents the IV to Oral Switch and it's a qualitative study um, that aimed to identify the the factors that are working against timely and prudent transitions from IV to oral antibiotics. Um, so the way um, the researchers did this study is they did a semi-structured interview with 20 doctors, um, nine females and 11 males, and they did that in the setting of a teaching hospital in the northeast of England. Um, the hospital did have an active antimicrobial stewardship program in place, so they had an IV to oral switch policy and um, and from the, what the author states, some automatic prompts on the chart after uh, 72 hours of IV and five days of oral therapy. So I don't know what those um, prompts look like, but it's possible that they have um, a different chart for antibiotics. Um, they used NVivo software for thematic analysis of interview transcripts driven by the framework approach. And I know that some of you are very familiar with qualitative research, but NVivo software is a computer software package that's used to analyze and, and, and organize qualitative data like interviews and open-ended survey questions. So what did they find? So they identified three key issues that influenced the prescribing decisions about whether to switch a patient to oral antibiotic. And the first one was consumerism or this risk of litigation or complaints if patient expectations were not met. Um, so there was an awareness amongst the doctors that were interviewed of the patient as a consumer um, and their demands or um, their expectations for IV antibiotics when they come into hospital with an infection. One participant said a lot of doctors are afraid to stand up and say, no, you don't really need antibiotics. And they talk about the fact that with, um, with Google and the amount of information that's accessible to patients, that some patients um, are a bit more demanding about what they think is best for them. <coughs> the second issue that was identified was limited opportunities for de-escalation due to the hierarchy of the medical team structure and this is certainly something I think that we see in Australia as well. So junior doctors not being comfortable to make that decision to switch patients to oral antibiotics and uh, deferring that decision um, to the consultant, um, so senior ward rounds which, which typically occur a bit less frequently than um, how often the junior doctor would review the patient. Um, antibiotic decisions on those rounds are considered um, less important than other clinical decisions, so the opportunity may not always arise to discuss antibiotics on those rounds. Um, and the participants said that continuing the status quo is easier than enacting change, with one participant saying it's harder when you're at the bottom trying to influence people above you. So I found that a really interesting um, finding. The third key issue was perceptions about IV antibiotics and that they are more potent than oral antibiotics and they have this kind of mythical status which um, the participants acknowledge wasn't necessarily evidence-based. Seem to be driven by fear of adverse outcomes and their own clinical experience of having patients that um, have been switched from IV to oral antibiotics with one participant saying it feels like you would treat the infection quicker and another saying you have this perception that IVs are always better and I liked this quote saying IV anything is better than oral. Um, so in terms of the discussion and recommendations from that research um, the, the authors have talked about the emerging power of the consumer and the fear of litigation and impact on guideline concordance. Um, and so essentially there are all these factors working against guideline concordance. Um, they also talk about consultant leadership with the current care models that are used in England and, and probably quite similar to Australia. Um, and that we need to have that awareness of team dynamics and support and empower junior doctors to make decisions. Their suggestions were to tailor strategies to demystify IV versus oral antibiotic efficacy. And that really, I thought was a good link with that previous study, the Canadian study about what concerns clinicians have um, and to engage consumers around the negative effects of IV antibiotic overuse. 
Um, so there's this perception that the IV antibiotics are always safer. Um, and they um, suggest examining strategies to streamline team decision making so that it doesn't rely on that senior consultant round. The limitations, obviously this was um, conducted in a single NHS trust or hospital in England, so whether the results are the same as what they would be if you did the study in another hospital or in Australia where the prescribing culture might be a bit different, um, that's a limitation of what we get out of the study. Um, the study talked about the doctor's perceptions of consumer expectations, which might be quite different compared to if they interviewed consumers themselves, um, and they didn't look at the role of nurses and pharmacists and we know that both can play a key role in IV to oral um, switch strategies. Okay, so in terms of developing safe switch criteria, um, this paper by Ad Kulfi and colleagues um, looked at um, variation in operationalizing switch criteria. Um, and their view that it was that often the switch criteria can be subjective. So saying something like the patient's improving or they're clinically improving. Um, and so what they aim to do is reach consensus for a safe switch. Um, and that they consider that important for guiding clinicians and achieving uniformity of practice. So in QI terms, we would call that reliability of practice, having the same thing happen for the same, for patients of the same um, presentation as they move through the hospital system. So their aim was to reach consensus on a set of IV to oral switch criteria and um, really define the measurable conditions that operationalize that criteria. So I found this a really interesting paper. They just were focusing on adult inpatients and they were focusing on the switch occurring 48 to 72 hours after IV therapy had commenced. So they did a literature review um, to identify switch criteria. They assembled a panel of experts, so they had 19 people from four countries, and they used the RAND uh, modified Delphi procedure. And so the Delphi procedure is a structured communication technique and it relies on a panel of experts and they essentially um, answer questionnaires anonymously and after each um, questionnaire round um, the questionnaire results are distributed to, to the panel members and a facilitator encourages the experts to review their, um, their decisions or their answers in light of the replies of their colleagues. Um, the RAND modified method is based on a structured review of the scientific literature occurring and then the collective judgment of that expert panel using the Delphi methodology. So again, I found this process quite interesting. So the steps they used in this particular study was to do a questionnaire round to look at the relevance and safety of measurable conditions that operationalise that IV to oral switch criteria. Then they had a face-to-face -face meeting looking at the ones that were uncertain and they rephrased some conditions. They then did another questionnaire round to look at the relevance of the IV oral switch criteria and then a final round of approval for that operationalized um, set of switch criteria. So in their literature review, they identified um, um, just over 1,500 articles and 86 contained switch criteria. Their expert panel was multidisciplinary and included members from the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, the US and the UK. Um, what they found was um, 41 measurable conditions were identified and after that first questionnaire, uh, 21 of those conditions were rejected, 10 were accepted and 10 were uncertain. In the face-to-face -face meeting, they looked at those 10 uncertain conditions and they rephrased um, four out of six of them and rejected four of them. Um, then they did that other questionnaire round and looked at the seven switch criteria based on the measurable conditions that they had agreed on and they accepted six and rejected one. And then they had a final um, set of six criteria and 16 measurable conditions. So, so that you know what this looks like, um, they publish um, what their findings were. And so the switch criteria is vital signs uh, should be good or improving for the patient. But the measurable condition that would define that is the systolic blood pressure being stable um, without inotropes or fluid resuscitation. Um, the switch criteria is signs and symptoms related to the infection should be resolved or improved. 
Um, and the measurable condition is the temperature being less than 38.3 degrees Celsius without um, antipyretics like, anti like paracetamol or the temperature being above 36 degrees. So I thought this was um, a really interesting way of achieving consensus on that switch criteria, which we know is really essential for getting a good um, IV to oral switch initiative happening in hospitals. The limitations were that the face-to-face -face meeting was um, attended just by the Dutch panel members um, and that that face-to-face -face meeting removed some of the anonymity that you find with the Delphi procedure. Um, the guidelines and instructions they acknowledge are unlikely to effectively and sustainably improve antibiotic use. It's only one step um, of um, getting patients on oral antibiotics faster. And I thought that this criteria was targeted at adult hospital patients following 48 to 72 hours of IV therapy. So some of the conditions where we target IV to oral switch, we actually hope that that switch occurs a bit earlier than 48 to 72 hours. And it also um, didn't comment on the paediatric population. So uh, moving on to paediatric patients, um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this paper by um, Brendan McMullen and colleagues um, on behalf of the ANSPID and ASAP group um, of ACID in Australia. Um, so this paper was a systematic review of the literature on IV to oral on IV duration of therapy uh, and the total duration of antibiotics and the timing of the IV to oral switch in, in paediatric patients, so patients that were under 18 years of age. Um, they did a, a Medline and, and Cochrane Central Register of Controlled Trials review and they included all study types published in peer-reviewed journals and conference abstracts and they, and they limited it to 36 infections. Um, so in terms of the method that they used for the systematic review, they looked at um, interventions that involved a comparison between different IV antibiotic durations, different oral antibiotic durations, the use of IV and oral antibiotics for those um, 36 infections um, and the criteria for switch. The outcome measures that the authors looked at was clinical improvement or recovery, persistence of infection, complications and recurrence of infection. Um, and they ended up including 170 studies in the systematic review. Um, with the information that they took from that um, systematic review, the authors developed some evidence graded recommendations um, for both IV antibiotic duration and the total antibiotic duration for those 36 infections and also some comments on the timing of the IV to oral switch. Uh, and the recommendations were made on the basis of um, a synthesis of the literature, uh, relevant guidelines which they've referenced in the paper and also expert consensus opinion from the, um, from the group. So um, the paper is very detailed and it goes through for each infection type what their findings were. So I just thought I'd present um, just the, new, uh, the pneumonia ones. So non-severe pneumonia, the authors found no difference in outcomes for three versus five days of antibiotics um, based on a Cochrane review and no difference between three to five days of antibiotics and longer durations based on four additional trials. Um, for moderately severe pneumonia, um, the authors found similar outcomes for <laughs> IV versus oral antibiotic use, um, and that was specifically looking at resolution of fever and oxygen requirements. Um, but they did note that severe pneumonia or complicated disease was excluded from, um, from the studies that they looked at for that. So how they synthesise this, these are the recommendations in the ANSPED ASAP guidelines. Um, which are in the paper but are also on the ACID website. Um, so for community acquired pneumonia, the minimum IV antibiotic duration for anything other than severe or complicated pneumonia is actually zero. So, um, so patients can be started on oral antibiotics. Um, the criteria for switch is clinical improvement. Um, for mild uh, uh, community acquired pneumonia, you need to give a minimum of three days. And for moderate or severe, um, pneumonia it's, uh, that's uncomplicated, it's less than or equal to seven days. Um, and there's some notes there, say for example, if the patient has a bacteremia, that, that that's different guidelines for bacteremia and they define what severe or complicated pneumonia is. 
Now, the authors did say that um, this uh, evidence and the, the cutoffs or the recommended minimums for things are really also based on the patient's um, clinical context and other things going on for the patient. So some of the guiding principles, which are almost like the switch criteria in the other paper, are having um, that the patient is clinically stable and they don't have signs of severe sepsis, um, that they're able to absorb oral antibiotics, that there is an appropriate oral antibiotic available um, and that the, the patient's going to take oral antibiotics and the family agrees with the plan. So linking in with that first study by uh, Jennifer Broom and colleagues, they've really thought about the patient engagement factor and for paediatrics, um, getting the parents and the families on board with um, giving oral antibiotics is really important. So the limitations, um, so the recommendations use best available evidence, but there wasn't always a lot of evidence available for some conditions. So um, I think the authors have been very transparent in showing where the recommendations are based on expert opinion. Um, and they also note that they've had to extrapolate some of the recommendations based on adult data. The minimum IV duration given and the total antibiotic duration may be a range rather than a definitive number of days and weeks. And sometimes we like really black and white, like three days or seven days or two weeks. Um, but because of their review of the literature, sometimes they, they there are um, sections in the guideline where they've had to give a range rather than um, rather than an exact number. Um, the authors note that there's a lack of evidence for routine long IV antibiotic courses, so they couldn't always compare um, a shorter course to a longer course, but it does really throw into question why people are using really long IV antibiotic courses for some conditions. Um, and they acknowledge that some patients, such as immunocompromised patients, may need longer durations of antibiotics. Um, but I think the, this, um, this guideline is an excellent way forward. I think it's presented, as I said, in a really transparent way um, and gives people much more confidence in using the recommendations. Um, a couple of other recent papers that I found um, that are about paediatrics as well was this one looking at IV diverse versus oral antibiotics for post-discharge treatment of pneumonia, complicated pneumonia. And this one that looked at IV to oral uh, versus oral antibiotics for prevention of treatment failure in children with complicated appendicitis. And it specifically looked at patients um, post-discharge after they went home. Um, and this, um, this group of authors actually have done quite a few IV to oral studies. So um, I won't go through the results, but essentially they found that um, there wasn't really a clear advantage of using IV therapy over oral therapy and the IV group might have um, additional risks of complications or revisits, which is something that we sort of suspect anyway. So finally, just to finish implementation of IV to oral switch um, criteria. So a paper written um, by um, Dilip Nathwani and colleagues, um, that's really just a narrative review that aims to look at the evidence to support the um, criteria from early switch and early discharge programs um, for IV to oral switch and gives a European perspective. It comments on the value of those programs and the implementation of those programs. So just present what they've said about implementation. Um, so for hospital specific programs, they say these uh, programs are essentially um, uh, implemented to reduce the number of IV inpatient antibiotic days. So that's a measure that you could use if you were um, doing an IV to oral switch initiative in your hospital. But the hospital programs typically use policies, treatment guidelines, surveillance data, education, targeted intervention and audit, but that the successful programs generally include immediate feedback. So directed to the physician in charge and with patient specific clear and unambiguous advice. Um, some of the barriers at a national level um, for these IV to oral switch programs, um, you know, from the European perspective is slow acceptance of centrally developed programs, that prescribing is influenced by factors other than national guidelines, which ties in with um, some of the other studies, and that the suggested approach was to develop consensus recommendations at a national level with key stakeholders, um, but then at a local level um, identify um, local leaders and, um, and support them with their professional development so that they are um, confident in implementing these initiatives. At a hospital level, some of the barriers uh, that 
that reassessment of antibiotics after 48 to 72 hours doesn't always reliably occur and they propose that the reasons for that are time constraints of staff or changes in staffing, um, that there's uncertainty sometimes about the indication for IV antibiotics or what the plan is, what the goal of therapy is um, due to a lack of communication and that the antibiotic prescribing culture prevents that early switch. Um, so in conclusion, um, there's lots of benefits of timely IV to oral switch and I'm sure anyone that's tuned into NCAS um, webinars would agree with um, and support those benefits. Um, the decision to switch patients to oral antibiotics is driven by a lot of factors including perceived patient expectations and how well engaged and educated the patient is. Um, prescribers' uncertainty about the safety and benefits, the prescribing culture and decision making hierarchy and prompts or processes for regular and timely review. Um, Evidence alone isn't enough to change practice. Uh, as antimicrobial stewards, we know that, um, but this is good confirmation of that for this particular initiative. And that consensus on switching criteria among experts and key stakeholders um, really needs to be complemented by that local leadership to drive change. Um, so I'll finish up there and take any questions and comments. Uh, thanks so much, Yvette, for a uh, very comprehensive and great talk on um, IV to oral switch. Uh, I don't think we have any questions from the floor. Uh, just one, uh, one I have is, do you think uh, there's any chance of getting that holy grail of a consensus guidelines to cover both adults and paediatrics for IV to oral switch, or do you think they are quite separate uh, situations? I actually think a lot of the criteria is pretty applicable to both populations and um, one of the things in that um, in the paper that looked at um, how to develop that operationalised switch criteria said that a lot of the criteria is actually quite similar. Mm -hmm. um, it's just how you translate to a, that to a measurable condition that can be um, the sticking point. Um, so I think I definitely think it's it's possible and a lot of you know there's a lot of overlap. Um, it's more about achieving that consensus and that buy-in from your key stakeholders that that is the right switching criteria to use. Sure, that sounds good. Uh, the other thing, meeting those criteria, who do you think is the best to assess the patients on a regular basis? Do you think it's the junior doctors, um, the pharmacists, or nurses who are actually seeing the patient to try and um, instigate an IV to oral switch kind of program? Um, I actually think that a multidisciplinary approach is, is best. So each of those um, disciplines brings different um, expertise and brings different knowledge to the process. So um, the nurse is the person at the bedside that spends the most time with the patient. They would know whether the patient's nauseous or vomiting, tolerating food. Um, they probably have the most contact with the patient's family in a paediatric setting. Um, the pharmacist has expertise on oral antibiotics. What we found is um, sometimes junior doctors don't know exactly what antibiotic to switch to. And um, you see a lot of IV to oral switch initiatives where um, part of the intervention is to explain what uh, what is the oral equivalent of an IV antibiotic and what dose to use. Um, and the pharmacists certainly have that knowledge on bioavailability to provide that reassurance. And I think the junior doctors, if they're empowered to make decisions about, um, about the oral switch and um, feel confident in those decisions that they're doing the right thing for the patient and that the consultant isn't going to, um, isn't going to get upset about that decision to switch patients to oral antibiotics, then um, you know, they have a really key role in, in actually enacting the switch. Oh, thank you so much, Yvette, for that. Um, and we look forward to hearing you again at some stage. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll just uh, be with you for a couple of seconds while we set up the next talk.
Okay, thank you. So now I'll um, introduce Doris Chibo, who's um, very graciously uh, said that she'll talk about some HIV characterization uh, from the Vigil Laboratory and uh, some of the uh, resistance profiles of HIV. Thank you very much. Hi, so as Rod said, I do I manage the HIV characterization lab uh, here at the W at Vigil. Um, we do a lot of virus load testing for HIV positive uh, patients as well as drug resistance genotyping. So today I'll uh, present um, some Victorian data uh, looking at the effect of uh, antiretroviral resistance that's present at baseline, so before a patient goes on treatment, and the effect that these um, mutations may have on current first-line HIV treatments. So just a couple of really basic slides to start off with. As we all know, HIV uh, is a retrovirus that infects and destroys, in particular, CD4 positive T cells, and this leads to weakening of the immune system. And without treatment, this can lead to um, AIDS, leaving a person susceptible to cancers and um, opportunistic infections. Um, HIV is treated using antiretrovirals, which disrupt the action of HIV. And they do this by targeting uh, different stages in the replicative cycle of the actual virus. The aim of therapy is to keep the amount of virus in the body at low or undetectable levels. And in the lab, we do this by monitoring the virus load. And this is done in conjunction or parallel CD4 count. In time, the immune system recovers because there's not enough cell free uh, virions to infect CD4 cells. So then in time, we see an increase uh, in a recovery of CD4 T cells. So it's not a cure, but lifelong treatment, but there are also side effects to the treatment over time. Here we just have a cartoon of the replicative cycle of, of HIV. Um, and there are six classes of antiretrovirals. And as I mentioned, they disrupt a particular stage in the way the virus replicates. Um, I can use the mouse here, yep. Uh, fusion and entry inhibitors here um, actually block the virus from entering and infecting the cell. Uh, nucleoside and non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors um, inhibit reverse transcription of viral RNA to viral DNA. Integrase inhibitors prevent the integration of the viral DNA to the host DNA. And protease inhibitors prevent the assembly and uh, release of mature virions. Here we've just got a timeline of the introduction of antiretroviral drugs in Australia. Um, the, biggest man, the biggest advancements in, in HIV really have been in the development of, of effective ARV therapies. Um, you can see in sort of the early 90s there was monotherapy, mid 90s to, to early 2000s um, they combined a couple of drugs from the same drug class and then started to use uh, different uh, drugs from different drug classes and that was to point heart. Uh, then they combined NRTIs into a single tablet towards uh, 2012-15 discovery of new anti-HIV targets and finally now single ta tablet regimens which combine drugs from different drug classes into one drug. So the benefits of early initiation of, of antiretrovirals have been well established. Uh, the START and Temprano trials um, show that early treatment reduced the risk of disease progression. And so in those trials, there was an, an immediate versus a delayed arm, and the immediate arm saw far better outcomes. Also using treatment as prevention, partner studies like the HBTN052, the European Partner Study and Opposites of Tract Study, which which um, included couples from Australia, also showed that early treatment reduced transmission. So as of August 2015, and in line with the US Department of Health and Human Services, the ASHAM, the Australian <laughs> Society of HIV Medicine, recommended that ARVs be initiated in all people with HIV, irrespective of their CD4 cell count. Uh, now, as part of a baseline evaluation of a person that's um, newly diagnosed with HIV, a drug resistance genotype is performed, and this is, is done as part of standard of care to guide the selection of, of antiretrovirals for that particular patient. Now, the turnaround time can be approximately two and sometimes pull out to four weeks in some difficult cases, and sometimes a clinician or even patients may choose not to wait for a drug resistance genotype result before initiating ART. 
Now, the reason why we do a baseline drug resistance genotype is that transmitted drug resistance still exists. And in Victoria, in incident cases, it sits roughly at around 8 to 10 percent. Now, certain drug resistance mutations confer a high level of resistance, while others have little or no impact at all. So, the question we wanted to explore was what effect do these drug resistance mutations present at baseline have on the current first line ARB regimens? We had a look at six years worth of baseline drug resistance genotyping data, which was performed as part of standard of care from bloods collected uh, between 2011 and 2016. These included um, newly infected or incident cases where we had serological evidence that the patient was infected within the last 12 months, so they were either seroconverting or there was a clear HIV negative antibody and a positive antibody within the 12 months, or they just presented as new diagnoses uh, where we had no previous antibody history. Now, these new diagnoses could also be a mixture of local acquisitions, so some may have been incident infections, or they may have been acquired overseas, uh, you know, potentially from people migrating from high prevalence countries where transmitted drug resistance rates in those countries may be actually high because of the different uh, you know, uh, therapies that are used there. Now, as per our usual protocol, baseline protease and reverse transcriptase sequences were analysed using the Stanford HIV database, which uses an algorithm uh, to determine the, uh, to give you a susceptibility profile uh, of all the drugs that are currently in use. Now, integrase uh, during this time was not standard of care, but we have been doing our own surveillance looking at the integrase region and whether there's any drug resistance mutations from 2010 to 2016, um, and we really only, only identified one major integrase inhibitor mutation conferring <laughs> high level resistance to raltegravir, and we identified that in 2016. Now, to determine the potential level of uh, failure in this population, drug resistance profiles that were generated were compared with 10 current first line treatments, treatment regimens. Uh, two were NNRTI-based, five were integrase inhibitor-based, and three were protease inhibitor-based. So only drug resistance mutations conferring intermediate level resistance or, or higher were considered to potentially contribute to a failing regimen. So those uh, resistance, those uh, sequences uh, that just produced low level or potential low level resistance were not included uh, in this study. Firstly, I'll just um, talk a little bit about the baseline transmitted drug resistance we saw. And here I've separated out incident infection from new diagnosis because we just saw some, you know, there was some difference there. We can see here uh, in the new diagnosis that there's a slightly higher rate, 3% higher rate of uh, drug resistance mutations identified in the new diagnosis compared to in the incident infections. And we sort of feel that this might be likely due to um, in the new diagnosis group due to migration from high prevalence countries where transmitted drug resistance is higher. So now for some results, we had a total of 1,670 patients that we genotyped um, during those six years. Uh, of these, 230 had at least one drug resistance mutation that would confer some level of resistance. So this would include the potential low level and low level resistance as well. Of those 230, 55 had two or more drug resistance mutations, and of these, 23 had any some level of resistance to two drug classes. So overall, over the six years, we had uh, 20 patients that had nuke and non-nuke, or some level of nuke and non-nuke resistance, and three patients that had some level of protease as well as non-nuke resistance. So here we've just got a breakdown of the different subtypes of HIV that we identified in this group of patients. Um, the majority of viruses in the incident cases, of which there are 65, were subtype B. And in this group, we only identified 11 non-B subtypes. And, and from memory, I think about seven were actually in 2016. And we saw a lot more diversity. So we identified 12 subtypes, and, we, and there was a lot more diversity in the new diagnosis group where we actually identified 47 non-B subtypes, which again 
might indicate um, likely acquisition overseas. To put that into, con into context, um, so HIV subtypes are geographically restricted. We talk about subtype B, which is, as you can see here, it's the dominant subtype that we see here in Australia, as well as in um, other Western countries. But it's really subtype C, uh, which is responsible for about half of the global infections, which is in sub-Saharan Africa and India. And other dominant subtypes, A and AG, are uh, responsible for about a quarter of the, um, oh, sorry, sub-Saharan Africa, here yeah, I'm going to South America, uh, for about a quarter of the um, infections again in, in Africa. And we saw a lot of um, circulating recombinant form AE. That was the next most dominant subtype after B that we identified in our group. And um, this particular subtype uh, is, uh, we see a lot of that in Southeast Asia. So now we'll look at the most common drug resistance mutations. Um, most of them, most of the common drug resistance mutations that we identified were in the reverse transcriptase region. And here I've separated them out into NNRTI and NRTI. Now with the NNRTIs, the most common drug resistance mutation we saw was K103N, and then followed by K101E, Y181C, and G190A. So these are changes um, at that particular codon in the reverse transcriptase region. When looking at the NRTIs, uh, the major, one of the major resistance mutations, M184B, was identified in 15 patients. And we also saw, saw quite frequently, separately as well as together, M41L and the T215 revertin. We saw, can see quite a bit of that separately as well as together. And I'll explain a bit about the T215 revertin on the next slide. Now, T215F4Y uh, arises from exposure to NRTIs, and this confers an intermediate level of resistance to ACT and D4T and low level resistance to DDI. So it, um, it really arises when the patient's been on some NRTIs. And the T215 revertin is a change, is one of these other amino acid changes, so a change other than F4Y at codon 215. And this mutation arises when viruses harboring the T215 FOI are actually transmitted to another individual. And in the absence of drug pressure, um, the actual virus is less fit with this mutation, so it tries to revert back to wild type and ends up as one of these codons. So in some way, it respects it can be a bit of a marker of transmitted drug resistance. Um, all it does is confer low-level resistance to AZT and D4T. And in our group, with all of the um, change that, that particular codon, they were all just one of these revertins. So what effect do those uh, specific drug resistance mutations that we saw in the, in the slide before, the previous one, how do they impact um, and on antiretrovirals? Uh, K103N, as I said, is a non-nuke uh, NNRTI resistance mutation. K103N confers high-level resistance to efavirenz and nevirapine. Y181C confers high level resistance to nevirapine and intermediate resistance to rilpivirine, favirenz, and atravirine. K101E confers intermediate level resistance to rilpivirine and nevirapine. G190A, high level resistance to nevirapine and intermediate level resistance to efavirenz. For the NRTIs, M184B knocks out um, FTC and 3TC, and the combination of M41L and the T215 revertin. Uh, just confers intermediate level resistance to A13 and D4T. So what effect do these baseline drug resistance mutations have on first-line treatments? So as I mentioned in the methods, um, if a patient had a drug resistance profile that conferred intermediate level resistance or above uh, to any one of the drugs in this particular regimen, then that um, particular patient was potentially, we would say that they would potentially fail that regimen. So out of the 1,670 genotypes that we had, 75 of those, or 4.5%, could potentially fail this particular regimen, so this efavirenz-based regimen. Uh, 51, or 
could uh, could potentially fail a milpivirine based regimen. And the rest of them, the integrase inhibitor based and the PI inhibitor based, would really only, they kind of roughly sat at around one or just under 1%. So there's much less um, likelihood of failure uh, if a patient was on an integrase based or a PI based regimen in, in the study. And this kind of falls in line, uh, or you know, sort of marries up with what Ashman recommends, um, with Ashman recommendations on what to start. Um, I think it was sort of at the beginning of last year they sort of changed their recommendations, and uh, integrase inhibitor based regimens are now recommended as first line treatment as well as PI based regimens, and that non nuke regimens were then uh, downgraded down to alternative regimen options where they previously had been actually recommended as first line. So here I've just got a couple of examples of some complex profiles that we see at baseline. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's good to get clinical notes and that can give us a bit of an idea about potentially, you know, if the patient is in local where they, where they would have acquired their infection. So here's one here, we've got a male sub, who's a subtype C. Uh, clinical notes said that he was HIV positive from PNG, new diagnosis here. And looking at uh, the drug resistance mutation I've identified, um, he had an M184V and he had a few non new mutations, major ones. And as you can see from his resistance profile, um, there's quite a few uh, drugs in those first line treatments that he wouldn't be able to use. Again, a, a female subtype C, like it, uh, the clinical notes said, overseas acquired. Um, again, quite a complex um, drug resistance profile. And again, it's really knocking out a lot of those drugs that could potentially be used. And this was a male with a uh, circulating recombinant form AE. We didn't have any uh, clinical notes. The virus load was high, CD4 count was quite low. So we're just, um, you know, querying whether it, the, whether his virus was acquired overseas. Uh, and again, he had quite an extensive um, drug resistance profile there, knocking out, again, a lot of the drugs um, that could be used in the first line treatment regimens. And finally, ML subtype B could potentially have acquired his infection here. And we see that he's got two of those major non nuke uh, resistance, uh, drug resistance mutation. And he's got that combination of M41L and T215, which doesn't really. Um, impact too much on drug resistance. So they're just some, some you know, profiles that we see at baseline that aren't just wild type susceptible to everything. So uh, to conclude, the non-nuke based regimens were more likely to fail than PI and integrase uh, inhibitor based regimens. So around four and a half percent, three percent for the non-nuke. So less than five percent failure in the entire. Uh, during the entire study, and the remaining regimens about 1% or less likely to fail. So we were able to determine um, in our study that the current first-line treatments are robust enough to compensate for the presence of low levels of drug resistance present at baseline. And thank you, just thanking my lab team, and um, take any questions. Any questions? Just Doris, what's the turnaround time on getting a genotype done for resistance profile done these days? I know previously it's taken quite long. Like I said, it's, it's it still takes around two to four weeks, depending on if the patient's got you know. Sometimes the non-B subtypes can be a little bit uh, more difficult to. It's all about whether we get the regions and whether the sequence read is clear enough, so sometimes we, we need to repeat a few or try alternative options to get a good sequence. So at best, sometimes it can go you know less than two weeks, but if it's a difficult case, that can protract a little bit. But we always do our best to get it out as soon as possible. Uh, Any other questions? No, if that's all we've got, well, thank you again for both our speakers for today's uh, 
in Kaz uh, General Club, and especially uh, Doris for doing a <laughs> bit, bit of a left of centre kind of talk for our kind of group, which does concentrate on uh, bacteria a little bit and um, fungi. So a uh, good HIV one is um, interesting to kind of keep a, an eye on what's happening in that sphere for everyone. Uh, thank you very much. The presentation will go online um, hopefully in the next couple of days, and we'll see you again in a month's time. Thank you.